we've seen how you can query various reports to retrieve existing resources and to measure performance in relation to your business goals. But we've only scratched the surface, so let's dig a little deeper into some examples of how you might use PMAX reporting in the API to optimize your campaign performance and ultimately reach the right customers at the right time. Assets are where you really have the opportunity to pull different levers to improve your campaign performance. So let's start there. When your campaign is just getting started and your asset groups are still new, it's important to set aside time for Google to learn about what assets perform best in the context of your specified business goal and which combinations perform best together. Wait three to four weeks or longer for smaller campaigns or longer term goals like lead generation before making optimization decisions based on asset group performance indicators. Frequent changes can result in performance fluctuations, but waiting and letting AI optimize before you step in will allow you to drive campaign performance that much further. Once you've waited at least three to four weeks, our recommendation to optimize your asset groups is to identify and replace your lower performing assets, but only after you've added the maximum number of assets. When it comes to Google's AI optimization, reaching the maximum number of assets is the best way to ensure your asset groups perform well. Only after that point do we recommend replacing assets based on their performance label. In order to replace any lower performing assets, you'd need to first retrieve the asset groups containing the maximum number of assets. Ideally, you would already have this information stored locally in your database so that you don't need to query the API every time you want this data. For that to happen, you can write a copy of your asset group entities to wherever you store your Google Ads data, for example, a database, immediately after successful creation. Then when it comes time to calculating things like asset group size, you don't even need to query the Google Ads API. So whether you've determined the number of assets per asset group based on data stored locally on the client or based on the results of querying the asset group asset resource, we now have the asset groups with the maximum number of assets. Really quick aside, for those asset groups that don't have the maximum number of assets, we highly recommend adding more assets and reaching that max while also varying the aspect ratios and content across assets to optimize inputs for Google's AI. There's a maximum limit per each type of asset, so you could add the asset field type to your query to determine how many assets of each type you have in your asset group. So now that we have all of the info we need to identify asset groups with the maximum number of assets, all we need is the performance label. And actually, I can just update my existing query to fetch the performance label and this way we can get everything we need at once. Note that performance labels are relative to assets of the same field type within the same asset group. So a low performance label in one asset group might mean something different than a low performance label in another asset group. The results will look something like this, where I get a row for each asset with their asset group resource name, field type, and performance label. To get more information about the assets, like the headline or description text, you'd want to either query the asset resource or look up data you've stored locally about the asset if that's available to you. If you manage advertising on behalf of businesses or you have a platform for businesses to configure their Google advertising, you might display all the lower performing assets as part of an asset group optimization workflow where users can create a new asset of the same type to replace it. Taking this a bit further, you could show the high-performing assets of that type as examples of what leads to stronger performance. Note that it's possible that an asset group will have no assets with a low performance label. This means that all assets are considered to be working well towards your specified business goal. Let's say you have all these headline assets and their performance labels, and you've also done a lookup in your local data store for the headline text. Comparing your asset content across performance labels might tell you something about what properties of your assets are most or least performant, like whether to include the fact that free delivery is offered, what price point users can expect, or the tone of the messaging. If you don't find a common theme across your assets, it's not a problem. That might mean your assets appeal to a variety of audiences or contexts. 
All of these different aspects of your assets are opportunities to experiment and to iterate based on what performs best. It's another area where the way you configure your assets and asset groups can be really pivotal to overall success. If you set up your asset creation workflow in a way that lets you categorize or templatize your assets, you can learn what aspects of your assets work best in different contexts and embrace those aspects when creating new assets. You might also supplement this performance information with data from the asset group top combination view, which offers added transparency around which asset combinations in an asset group are the highest performers. This can give you an idea of what kinds of creatives, types of assets, or sizes you might want to add more of to gain incremental performance. So where the asset group asset report gave us a performance label for each asset, the asset group top combination view gives us an idea of which assets perform well in combination. Each row of this report will contain a list of asset group asset combination data objects containing the top performing asset combinations in an asset group. For example, a single asset group asset combination data object might look like this.